All right, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be diving into module 1.3. And where we left off in module 1.2, we were really starting to um, take apart a randomized clinical control trial and really trying to understand and interpret what was being measured and what are the primary outcomes. So if we go back to our abstract that we've been working through for these uh, last few modules, we've been able to understand uh, what the question is, what kind of study, how was the study connect, um, um, conducted, what was measured, and really now we're starting to dig into what was the primary result and what, if, if there are any, any secondary results. So understanding uh, not only what was measured, but understanding how what was measured impacts what our primary results are. So in this case, the primary result of the study is the incidence of new illness compatible with COVID-19 did not differ significantly between the participants receiving hydrochloroquine and those receiving placebo. And then the secondary result that the paper notes is side effects were more common with hydrochloroquine than with placebo, but there were no serious adverse reactions reported. So, Looking back in, at, at our book, where are we in terms of this process of understanding a scientific study? So we've gone through our initial observations, understanding the literature, understanding how we're going to create a study, and now we're really digging into the meat of what is the results of those studies. And, you, and what's important to note here is really this is a flow diagram. So what you start with at the beginning really is gonna impact what your primary results are. So the primary result of the study and the paper that we've been going through is this figure. So we're going to spend some time really dissecting what this figure says and what is being measured. So the first thing we want to, we, we note in this figure is there are two colors on this graph. So what groups are being com compared? In this case we have hydrochloroquine and then we have the placebo. So we're looking at those specific groups um, in this graph. The next thing we want to understand, oops, sorry, <laughs> is uh, what is being manipulated. This is always gonna be on the x-axis of any uh, scientific figure. We'll go into a little bit about why that is. And in this case, what's being manipulated is time. We're seeing how many uh, new cases of COVID there are as we increase in trial day. And then lastly, we're looking at what is responding. So what is responding to what is being manipulated? So in this case, we have the percent of new patients with COVID-19. So we broke down a little bit about what each of these things are. Now we can sort of dig in and look at the meat of the figure and understand what trends are evident? What do we see as we increase in trial day? And we can see that as we increase in trial day, the number of COVID-19 patients goes up. But critically, there's no differences between the group that's being, um, the two groups that are being compared. So you can see that there's not any strong upward or downward trends in terms of those patients who received hydrochloroquine and those who received placebo. So now that we've sort of thought through a little bit of this, I want to dig into what is the idea of what is being manipulated and what is being responding. So when we talk about a responding variable, we in science call this a dependent variable. And a good way to uh, remember a helpful acronym for remembering what a dependent variable is dry. So where D is the dependent variable, R is the responding variable, so the dependent variable is responding, and Y is for the Y axis. So the dependent variable that is responding is always gonna be located on the Y axis. We can do something similar with the, what, with the variable that's being manipulated, and the acronym for that is MIX. So we see the variable that is being manipulated, M, is called I, the independent variable, 
and X for the X axis. So together we have the final acronym of dry mix. So this is just a helpful way for you to be able to say, okay, what is a dependent variable? What is an independent variable? And how can I use them to talk about what is happening in an experiment? So a scientist might say, well, our dependent variable was the number of new patients um, with COVID and our independent variable was our trial day. And from that, we're able to understand the trends of new patients with COVID-19 uh, for those that receive hydrochloroquine and those who receive placebo. So that's how you sort of think about these terms in a, in a global sense. So now that we understand what's being measured and we understand the trend that's happening, we need to ask another part, another question in order to get an idea of whether or not this is a good study. And that is, are the trends that we see representative of a larger population? So here, you know, ultimately with an experimental trial, we're constrained to the number of people that we can, we can bring into a study. And ultimately, we want to be able to say, yes, we believe that our study population is representative of what would happen if we performed our tests in a, in a larger population. So the first thing that I want you to do when you see a paper is to look at the sample size. So this is going to give us an idea of how specific um, a trend might be. So a great example was given uh, in your book looking at the effects of caffeine on memory. And you can see in the graph, to, uh, graph on the left, we have only a few, um, a few study results. And you can see that the trend that we see is only about a 15% increase. But when we have much more people in the study, we see that that 15% increase increases dramatically to about 45% increase. And ultimately, this graph on the right is likely more representative of the actual effect of caffeine on memory. So that's always going to be your first question when you're thinking about, is this a representative population? The next thing you need to think about is, who is being measured? Are we measuring people who, go, college students who are in a psychology class, which is very common in a lot of psychology studies? Are we looking specifically only at hospitalized patients? And uh, would that potentially change the trend um, if we're only thinking about hospitalized patients? And lastly, and probably most importantly from this, is who is being left out? So is this a study only looking at those who have healthcare, for example? Is this a study um, where, where we're only looking at uh, those who are in a higher socio uh, dem demographic group? Who is being left out often, often gives you the question of whether or not this study is representative throughout a population. And then a lot, uh, one more thing that you, I would like you to sort of think about is what assumptions is the author making? And this is probably the one that's most difficult to tease apart um, and is often something you have to read very specifically in the results of a scientific study in order to really um, think through what assumptions the authors are making. An example of an assumption is we're assuming that people who are exposed to COVID-19 will get sick in four days. That's an example of an assumption. Now, how might that change if in reality, um, people don't get sick until 10 days after, after infection? So again, your trends might change because of these differing assumptions. So now we've essentially gone through our complete abstract here. We've gone through understanding what is the question, what kind of study is it, how was the study conducted, what was being measured, what are the primary results, any secondary results, and then ultimately, now that we've gone through all of these and evaluated whether or not we believe that these are strong studies and um, what was being measured is being measured accurately, we can look at what the authors say is their primary conclusion. 
And in this case, we find that after high or moderate exposure to COVID-19, hydrochloroquine did not prevent illness compatible with COVID-19 or confirmed infection when used um, post-exposure prophylaxis after four days of exposure. So from this, we can finally sort of be able to say, okay, well, based on what I know about randomized clinical controlled studies, I know that we that they enrolled a large a large participant pool. And lastly, I agree and understand the primary results, what went into those results and how they were being measured. And that allows me to say yes or no, I agree with the authors of the study. In this case, I very much agree with the authors of the study. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So that was uh, uh, module, all of module one, 1 1.3. Go take a break, drink some water, and then come back and I'll see you for module two.